Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, reminder, please leave yourselves muted. There are uh, almost a hundred of you so far and there's bound to be some background noise in some of your households. So for the sake of a, uh, an orderly presentation, please do leave yourselves muted throughout. Welcome to Craftsbury Sculling webinar series number 12. This week is a departure from the uh, usual format because our topic does not bear directly on modern sculling and how to do it. Um, if you have been to a camp at Craftsbury in the last three years or to any of our webinars, uh, this week's presenter shouldn't need an introduction. Erica Sloan has uh, been our fleet manager for the last three years and the producer of this webinar series behind the scenes. But for the sake of giving credit where credit is merited, we wanna recognize Erica as the largely behind the scenes presence of the webinar series. She does all of the email and marketing and web-based uh, correspondence for this webinar series, which allows the presenters to just show up and do their thing. And that's been of inestimable value this year. And this week she gets the spotlight to herself. Um, I do wanna tease next week's webinar. It is uh, going to be largely a Q&A based format. We're gonna call it Ask the Coach, and it is going to feature um, Rick Rickey or uh, Dr. Parnassus or Coach Kochi. Uh, he goes by many aliases and myself. So uh, that will allow me to pontificate and Rick to philosophize and uh, we hope to have a good time doing that. So um, we will see you next week. I will turn it over to Erica at this juncture. And uh, just a reminder, if you have questions for Erica, please message those to me privately in the chat and I will vet and organize them for the Q&A section at the end of her presentation. So, Erica, all you. All right, thanks very much, Troy. Um, I feel like I owe a triple thanks to Troy. Um, one, for indulging me and allowing me to talk on this topic, um, which, as he mentioned, is not really traditionally what we've been covering in this webinar series. Um, but I do hope that you will find it enjoyable and informative, even if it's not directly applicable to helping your sculling. Um, I, I hope it'll be interesting. Um, so a little bit about the origins for this talk or the uh, inspiration for it. Um, I studied classical studies was my major at Middlebury College. And my very first day, or uh, really my first class of college was um, a meeting of my freshman seminar, which was on Sophocles, the Athenian playwright. And the professor, who turned out to be my advisor, uh, had us all go around and say a little something about ourselves. And when I mentioned that I was a rower, he kind of went off on a tangent about the essential connection between rowing and Athenian democracy. Um, and so I was totally hooked from that moment. And it was also, I think, rather profound that my academic experience in college and my experience rowing in college were sort of inextricably linked from that first moment. Um, so that's kind of a jumping off point for this talk. Um, and I'll touch more on that later about that connection between rowing and democracy. But um, first off, I do feel like I need to give a disclaimer, which is that I studied classics as an undergraduate. I am not an expert, um, do not have a PhD, and I'm sure there are others who are far more knowledgeable than I am. Um, that being said, I've done a lot of research. A lot of this is stuff that I write about in college. Um, I'll primarily be covering primary sources, a little bit of secondary sources. Um, I think I'll share some suggestions for further reading at the end of the talk, um, but I'm gonna do my best to make sure that uh, I don't say anything that's inaccurate and hopefully don't butcher any pronunciations. Um, but yeah, um, okay, I'm gonna start sharing my screen with my presentation. Okay, so. Uh, the title of the talk is Triremes and Trojans, uh, and a, a handful of people mentioned to me before the talk that they didn't actually know what a trireme was, and so we will definitely talk about that. But this image right here on the title slide uh, is a trireme, which is a type of ancient warship, um, and again, we'll go into more detail on that. But the, the talk will start off pretty quickly talking about triremes, and it will kind of conclude talking about um, Trojans. So we will get there. Um, and 
This mosaic was found in preserved Roman ruins in Tunisia. So it's in a museum in Tunisia, but it's pretty accurate, at least to how we think um, the triremes would have looked they, with the decorative eye on the prow um, and the banks of oars and the sails. So I thought it was a cool picture. Okay, so um, origins of rowing. Um, like most sports, most modern sports, um, you can kind of trace the development of them towards some form of transportation or uh, warfare simulation. Um, but we also have record going back really far of sports being used um, for recreation. Um, and so I think there's sort of a connection to be had between the idea that warfare was a route to glory in the ancient world as were the ancient Olympics where it all originated and then rowing as a modern Olympic sport is sort of a way to achieve glory in our modern world. Uh, I also think it's interesting that rowing is something that sort of has both of those models. It was used for human transportation really early but it was also used for warfare um, and we have really early references to it being participated recreationally. So any talk about the origins of rowing really should primarily be about ancient Egypt or cover ancient Egypt quite a lot. And unfortunately, that's not my area of knowledge. So um, I apologize for that for any Egyptologists out there. Um, I wouldn't do it justice. So I'll just mention a little bit and then we'll move on. But um, the earliest references we have to people rowing were pretty much in Egypt. Um, there's evidence going back thousands of years that people rowed on the Nile um, that to travel with the current they used sails and to travel back up the current, they used oars. Um, there are funerary um, stashes that included boats from um, models of boats with rowers that we have in museums. Um, but particularly interestingly, uh, ancient Egypt had the first reference to re rowing as a recreational event. Um, it was on the funerary inscription of the, the tomb of the Pharaoh Amenhotep. So this was around 1400 BCE. Um, and it was basically referencing, you know, glorifying him, referencing his feats of oarsmanship. Um, and there's a quote here, which I actually found on the website called Hear the Boat Sing, which is modern rowers who are talking about the history of the sport. And so this is the inscription. Um, Amenhotep was strong of arms, untiring when he took the oar. He rowed at the stern of his falcon boat as the stroke oar for 200 men. Pausing after they had rowed half a mile, they were weak, limp in body and breathless, while his majesty was strong under his oar of 20 cubits in length. He stopped and landed his falcon boat only after he had done three miles of rowing without interrupting his stroke. Faces shone as they saw him do this. So perhaps a bit of an exaggeration, but there we go. Um, so pivoting now away from Egypt back towards Greece, which will occupy most of our talk, um, this fresco or this you know, cut out of a fresco, which is actually quite a bit larger, uh, was found on the island of Thera, um, which is now Santorini. Um, and the city there, Akrotiri, was well preserved by a volcanic eruption that happened around 1600 BCE. So that was well into the, that was well in the Bronze Age, um, before really when we talk about the classical world. And um, there were probably seven or so ships on this fresco. I just happened to zoom in on this one. Um, but you can see the oarsmen at work. So that was quite a bit of a long time ago. Um, for context, when we talk about the Trojan War, uh, the Iliad was written about 750 BCE, but the war itself was thought, if it did take place, it was thought to have taken place around 1200 BCE. And we'll get more into the Trojan War later, but now we are going to kind of jump way forward in history to classical Greece. So the fifth century BCE, and we'll primarily focus on Athens. Okay, so the focus of this um, section is going to be really on the trireme. And so here is an image of a modern tri trireme, um, which was produced in the 80s, sort of a co collaboration between classicists, historians, archaeologists, shipbuilders, and they kind of compiled all the ancient sources that they could and modern shipbuilding knowledge, and they created what they believe is an accurate model of a trireme. Um, so you can see the, the, well, actually I'll talk about it a little bit and then I'll go back and show you the picture so you can see a little bit more. Okay, so what was a trireme? It was an oared warship. There were about 170 rowers arranged in three banks of oars on each side. Um, if you imagine 
trying to stay in time with any team boat you've been in, even an eight. Now imagine having 170 of you. Um, and there were an additional 30 rower, or th sorry, 30 personnel on the deck. So that would include the captain and the commander of the ship, the steersman, um, a pipe player for music to keep people in, in, in time, and then a complement of soldiers for whether uh, if fighting broke out on the deck. So the oarsmen really didn't fight at all. They, if the ship got boarded, they were not in a good position because they really just had their oars down there. So the name of the ship, um, we call it trireme coming from the Latin for tri-remis, um, which would be like three rower um, for the three banks of oars. The Greek word would have been trieres. And uh, the boats had predecessors in, um, there was the pentaconter, which had one bank of oars on each side, 25 rowers uh, each, so 50 total. So that's where its name comes from. And then it was thought to have developed through the bireme, which was two banks of oars to then get to the trireme where things kind of settled for a while. Um, drawing a modern parallel here, um, we called the boats that we row, we based their name off of the arrangement of the oars and how many rowers there are. So similar to uh, how these ships were named. Um, they were likely a Phoenician invention. They weren't necessarily Greek, but they were later adopted by the Greeks. And they were pretty long and narrow, so about 40 meters long, six meters wide, made of lightweight woods, and they had the bronze ram on the prow. The oars were about 13 to 14 feet long, uh, which is not super long when you think about a modern sweep oar is about 12 feet long, so not a huge difference there. Um, so we'll go back here just so I can point out the prow on the ship. So that was going to be for ramming, which we'll get into in just a second. Um, so these ships were extremely expensive and labor intensive to construct and maintain. Um, the construction of them was usually funded by the city itself, in this case Athens, but they were maintained, at least in Athenian society, by wealthy citizens. I'll talk a little more about that uh, later. And pretty much all of the space on them was used for rowers. They were super cramped. They really had no room for supplies. Um, they had to travel uh, near shore and be carried out of the water overnight. Otherwise, um, they'd kind of get soggy and be less watertight. Um, so kind of a funny, I was talking about this at dinner last night and Andrew, one of the rowers here, um, drew a comparison to just how impractical our boats are as well. Like you can't leave them in the water. You have to take them out every time you go. You can't really store anything or take anything with you when you're in the boat. Um, so, you know, not dissimilar in that sense. And we have some historical attestations as to how fast they could go. Um, but a, cru a general cruising speed, probably if they were just kind of um, not quite revved up to ramming speed, but cruising would probably be about eight knots, which I looked into it and it's about a two minute per 500 meter split, um, if that gives you some context. Um, and the key with these ships was that they were super light and agile, um, very, very fast, very maneuverable, as long as the rowers were skilled enough to take advantage of that and to you know make the boat do the maneuvers it needed to do. Um, and so this is a quote from Paul Cartledge, who's a classical historian, um, who wrote that, the triremes were basically a glorified racing eight come waterborne guided missile. So on the topic of them being a waterborne guided missile, uh, we'll go next to um, the slide on trireme warfare. So the simple tactic was ramming, um, but it was slightly more complicated um, because the Again, the rowers had to be skilled enough to maneuver the ships, um, and they had to be able to row fast enough to ram the prow into the enemy ship hard enough to disable it. And then they had to be able to very quickly row back out. So if any of you have been to Craftsbury and heard Troy opening Doc Talk the past few years, he mentions two of the things that he thinks are essential for every oarsman to be able to do. And one of those is backing. And so I hope that Troy is happy to hear that that was also critical for Athenian rowers. Um, to be able to get the ship back out of there after they'd rammed the enemy ship. Um, they also had to be able to turn very quickly. Um, if they backed out and then weren't able to complete a turn, they would make themselves vulnerable to um, an enemy ramming them. So really these were super fast moving, um, making quick turns um, and kind of darting in and out around the enemy ships. Um, they used a combination of, um, that should say oars and sails for travel. Um, but once they were at battle, uh, only rowers were powering the boats. The sails came down and the masts were actually stored on land. So these battles were all taking place shallow waters close to shore. 
And most of the battles were fought at dawn because that's when the seas were calm enough for the oars to work optimally, which uh, another modern parallel, um, we rowers often do row early in the day so we can get that flat water. Um, so anyway, as I've kind of mentioned, all of this requires super highly trained, highly skilled rowers. Um, you wouldn't be able to outflank an enemy ship without superior oarsmen. Um, and so this is kind of how Athenians were able to really dominate warfare, uh, naval warfare at least, um, in this time period, which I'll get into in just another second. So the crew, um, this is a meme that was posted to Reddit. Um, and it's a screen capture from Ben-Hur, which I have not actually seen, but there's a naval battle in the movie. Um, and in the movie, all of the rowers on the, sla on the ship are slaves, um, which is actually not accurate. I think that's like a common misconception is uh, that most ancient rowers were slaves chained into their galleys. And that's not really true. Um, also, there's a, a lover, uh, a level of, excuse me, a level of humor to this meme, which I think is saying that, um, you know, back in the day, you rode because you were forced to, and nowadays you pay for a very expensive education to get a degree and also row. Um, I think it's, I think it's about collegiate rowing. I could be wrong. Um, anyway, moving forward. So, ours women were generally free citizens or resident, um, or residents, not all citizens in Athens, but they were often from the poorer or lower classes in the city, uh, becoming a soldier via the Navy, via the, as, as an oarsman, was way more accessible an option than being a foot soldier in the hoplite class. They were usually more middle class because they had to be able to afford their armor um, and their shield. And it wasn't really a route to becoming a professional soldier for the lower classes. So the rowing was an option for them, kind of an end to that. And Athens did maintain crews of professional rowers who were paid for their work and they were they trained extensively in peacetime which um, because Athens as a city had the funding uh, to be able to fund these thousands of, of rowers to be training full-time and so that was pretty unusual and part of why Athens was so successful at this trireme warfare um, and the funding um, the ships were generally constructed from the city's treasury but then basically as sort of like a way of paying tax to the city. Um, wealthy citizens were chosen to um, perform duties for the city and fund things each year. And so wealthy citizens were chosen to be the trearchs or uh, commanders effectively of the ships. And they were responsible for uh, outfitting them, maintaining them and taking care of the crews, supplying all of that stuff um, for about a year during their tenure. Um, so how fit do we think these rowers were? Um, I was kind of curious, I tried to look into it, and there was a study that was done by an exercise physiologist involving the work of the modern trireme that I mentioned. Um, unfortunately, I could not find the paper that he wrote, but I found an article about the paper. And basically he did some like metabolic testing on rowers who were in the triremes and consulted with historians who, um, you know, in Thucydides, there's enough references to how fast the ships could go and how quickly they could cover a certain distance so they could kind of figure out what the metabolic demands would have been. And the conclusion was that the oarsmen in these triremes were basically as fit, if not more fit than, more fit than elite athletes in our world. So, or in our time. So it's sort of imagining that they were all as fit as Olympic rowers, but there were thousands of them in the Athenian Navy, which is a little hard to wrap our heads around. Um, but it does kind of bring up an interesting question about um, human suitability towards endurance work and things like that. Um, again, I wish I could have read the study. But anyway, uh, there's also a letter from an Athenian general, Nicias, uh, that's uh, in Thucydides, who is a historian who wrote about the Peloponnesian Wars. Um, and I'll read an excerpt from that. Um, so Nicias's letters, he said, um, now I need not remind you that the time during which a crew is in its prime is short and that the number of sailors who can start a ship on her way and keep the rowing in time is small. So just reinforcing that these athletes were very skilled, but also I think that kind of gives potentially an indication that their training was periodized, periodized in some way, um, that they were sort of trained to peak at a certain point for a certain battle. So I thought that was interesting. Um, in terms of coordinating the crew, uh, we're not entirely sure how it was done with that many rowers, but there are attestations in literature for rowing calls um, that were made. And there was also generally a piper on board um, 
but typically what they found with this modern recreation, which I'm about to show you a video of, was that um, it often got really loud. So it's hard to imagine that they could have heard the pipers anyway. But okay, this modern recreation, uh, the ship is called Olympias. It's now a commissioned ship in the Hellenic Navy. And they did all these sea trials with it to sort of gain insight into how the trireme functioned and how, how fast it could go and how quickly it could turn. And they basically found out that its speed, it was very fast and very maneuverable, even with an inexperienced crew. So it's impressive to think about how quick and maneuverable it would have been with more experienced crews. Um, and I'm going to share in the resources at the end of the talk um, a longer video with more information. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing for just a second and pull up. There's a bunch of these short kind of promotional videos of the ship on YouTube. So I'm just going to show you guys one of those really quickly. Um, let's see. Okay, I hope you are now seeing YouTube. There's some dramatic music to accompany it. Um, but they basically would get crews of tourists who were interested to go and fill out these ships and take it out on the water. And so I think this is an advertisement for that tourism experience. So it's just to get a sense of what it looked like um, under war. I'm sorry for the drama of the video. As you can see, these rowers are probably not nearly as in time or as skilled as we would expect the Athenians to have been. get the idea from that. Um, go back to my slideshow now. Okay, so um, at risk of oversimplifying, I think with the knowledge we know about the triremes and the crews, I'd like to draw another modern parallel, which is that um, at least in the US, often you, as long as you have a team in your area, you can start rowing and you don't have to have a ton of experience like you do with other youth sports and you can get a scholarship and row in college um, and become quite successful. However, you do need the sort of like the capital to have the equipment and so often donors or benefactors are providing that. So I think there's, there's a parallel there with um, sort of the poorer Athenians being able to participate in the sport or sorry, in the, uh, in the, in the Navy. Um, and they were funded by the wealthier citizens um, so that the equipment could be maintained. Okay, so next we'll talk a little bit about these ships. Oh, actually, uh, this is very interesting. There's an article out there called The Lost Technology of Ancient Greek Rowing. Uh, and it was written by a classical archeologist named John Hale and it was published in 1996. And I happened to Google John Hale and found out that he was an oarsman at Yale and he's written extensively on this topic. Um, but in this particular article, he made an argument that Greeks may have actually had a sliding seat to their, or a sliding stroke to their rowing. And so there's um, a record of something called an hy a hyperesion, which is a rowing cushion, which means literally under the rower. Um, and he argued that they could likely slide along on the cushion to engage powerful leg muscles like on their rowing bench. Um, there's evidence in comedies of people talking about um, some of the ancient comedies about like wearing out their rumps on the rowing benches. And the rowing benches were low to the feet, not raised. Um, so as you can see in this relief, which was from the Athenian Acropolis, if you can see my cursor, um, this rower certainly looks like he has his knees bent, which is part of what Hale was basing his argument on. Um, so I thought that was interesting and kind of compelling. And he basically argues that that technology was probably lost because there's no reference of it in uh, Roman naval warfare or the Venetian galleys that raced in the Middle Ages. Um, nothing really until the mid 1800s when the more modern form of rowing, people started sewing leather onto their rowing pants so that they could grease it and slide on the rowing bench. 
and then eventually that developed into the mechanical sliding seat. So pretty cool possibility there. Okay, so the next topic is naval warfare in classical Greece. Um, so this is just a map of the Greek world during the Persian Wars, which we're about to talk about. Um, so as you can see, everything in orange was the Persian Empire. Um, and then here in blue, we have most of what we're talking about in Greece. So Athens is right here. You can see my cursor. Um, Sparta, which will be relevant later, is down here. And in red here are a lot of the battles of the Greco-Persian Wars, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But Thermopylae is the famous one from 300, which is over here. Um, Marathon was right in here. And then the Battle of Salamis, which we'll focus on, was right in here. So that's just kind of a broad scope of it. And we'll go, um, and this is a kind of a funny slide because this is a century of really interesting history compressed into a few words. Um, but basically, the early 5th century kind of started off with the Greco-Persian Wars. Um, the Persian Empire was trying to conquer Greece, and it was really a, a huge threat to the Greek way of life. Um, so the Greeks were understandably desperate to fight off. And Greece at that time was not a unified um, country by any means. It was a collection of different states, um, but they kind of banded together to fight off the Persians. The Battle of Marathon was one of the first major engagements in 490 BCE, and I won't get too far into it because it wasn't a naval battle, but it is relevant for reasons um, to another modern sport, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. So in between the Battle of Marathon and the Battle of Salamis, um, Themistocles was an Athenian um, citizen who Honestly, super interesting guy, um, and I'm not going to go too much on a tangent on him, but he's super interesting if you are willing to go look him up later on. But basically, he convinced Athens in 484-483 to build a fleet of 200 triremes. And remember, they were extremely expensive to build, but they had just found a silver mine and were able to use the excess from the silver mine to create this fleet of 200 triremes and outfit it, which proved to be um, a very good move because the next thing, the next big engagement in the Persian Wars was an invasion um, in 480 BC, which led to the Battle of Salamis. And so um, we have an account of the battle from Herodotus, uh, also from the trage tragedian Aeschylus, who was actually fought at the battle and um, subsequently wrote one of the few tragic plays that had a historical subject and not a mythological subject um, about this battle. So it was, it was an incredibly pivotal battle. It is potentially one of the most consequential military engagements in history. And the gist of it was that, um, here's sort of a, a view um, on a map, but basically you can see these ships arrayed are all the Persian ships. So the Persian ships greatly outnumbered the Greek ships. Um, and the Greeks were thinking about fleeing. Um, they didn't want to stay. Um, and fight the Persian fleet, which was commanded by Xerxes. And Themistocles convinced them to stay. And he kind of made this gambit. He sent a messenger to Xerxes, and he said the Greek ships were going to withdraw, but he wanted to fight there and draw the fight at Salamis, whereas the Greeks wanted to draw the fight elsewhere. Um, so it was kind of this brilliant strategy, which I'll explain how it paid off in just a moment. But there was an interesting quote um, from Herodotus about this, which um, I thought it was worth sharing for anyone who's raced and thought about jumping the starting line. Um, there's a little metaphor in here where when discussing strategy with the other Greek commanders, Themistocles um, was sort of scolded by a Corinthian commander who said, Themistocles, in the games, those who start off before this signal are beaten with a stick. To which he replied, those left behind at the starting line are never crowned with the victor's wreath. Um, so I thought that was kind of a cool, um, just parallel to what we think about with um, modern racing. You don't want to get left at the starting line, but you also don't want to jump the start. Um, but it turned out Mystically's strategy was genius, um, and he was absolutely right that it was right to stay and fight Salamis, because the strait here was narrow enough um, that per the Persian, even though their navy was so big, they could only get about 100 ships in at a time, and they weren't nearly as skilled or as maneuverable as the Athenian ships were. And so the Athenian ships were basically able to kind of pick them off and ended up absolutely destroying the Persian fleet during this battle, um, leading, uh, effectively leaving Xerxes to flee um, and saving the Greek way of life. I mean, it wasn't entirely the end of the Persian Wars. There was a battle about a year later, the Battle of Plataea, that really finished it off. 
Um, but it was hugely pivotal um, with the, one of the most decisive victories in history on the side of the Athenians. And you can kind of say that this had a huge impact on the rest of the course of Western civilization because Athens was then basically able to enter its golden age, um, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But you can basically attribute that to the naval supremacy of the Athenian triremes and their oarsmen. Um, so um, there's a quote here from Plutarch um, who reported that Themistocles was initially scorned for having deprived Athenians of the spear and shield and degraded them to the rowing bench and the oar. But Plutarch's assessment of that was that the fact remains that the Greeks were saved by their prowess at sea and that it was these very triremes which won back the city of Athens. Xerxes' own, own actions are proof of this, for although his land forces were intact, he took to flight after the defeat of his ships because he believed he was no longer a match for the Greeks. So pretty compelling. Um, and basically having this powerful navy enabled Athens to solidify its hegemony over the rest of Greece, which basically maintained um, through the rest of the fifth century until their defeat at the hands of Sparta in the Peloponnesian War. Um, at that point, their opponents had developed tactics where they could counteract the unmatchable prowess of the Athenian oarsmen. So it's not that the other cities developed better rowers, but they figured out ways around the skill of the Athenian rowers. So before that was the golden age of Athens. Um, basically, after the Persian Wars, um, with their power secured and their finances secured, um, Athens had that security to thrive. And so this is where the democracy and culture that we associate with ancient Greece really flourished. Um, this was the era of architecture. The Parthenon was built, the Acropolis, um, tragedy, comedy, the, so all the drama on the, the ancient theater, um, philosophy, literature, culture, politics. Um, it was all really flourishing here during the golden age. And I have a bunch of quotes to basically say that this was um, largely attributed, could largely be attributed to the rowers, which seems maybe extreme, but um, lots of other people seem to have come to that conclusion. And this was kind of where my professor was getting at that first day of my, my college career, um, that there's this essential connection between rowers and Athenian democracy and the golden age. And so um, Cartledge, who I mentioned earlier is a Greek historian says, Bliss it was in that dawn to be alive, especially for the ordinary, relatively poor members of the Athenian citizen body, who found their increasingly vital military role in rowing the war fleets increasingly rewarded with significant increment of democratic political power. So shows that being able to join the Athenian Navy was an excellent step for these people. Um, and then John Hale, who I mentioned earlier, um, who was the rower slash classicist said, the end result was a century of naval supremacy that built Athenian hegemony in the Aegean. The golden age of Athens was in fact founded on the sweat of a few thousand skilled rowers. Um, also pretty compelling. And uh, for ancient sources, Aristotle in his politics said, on the other hand, the victory of Salamis, which was gained by the common people who served in the fleet and won for the Athenians the empire of the sea, strengthened the democracy. And lastly, um, this was a point from pseudo Xenophon, so it was associated with Xenophon, but probably wasn't actually him, who's, who was another no, noble Athenian, who said, my first point is that it is right that the poor and the ordinary people there should have more power than the noble and the rich, because it is the ordinary people who man the fleet and bring the city her power. It is these people who make the city powerful, much more than the hoplites and the noble and respectable citizens. So basically, rowers are responsible for the flourishing of the Golden Age of Athens, which gave us so much of the culture that is relevant to our culture today. So uh, I hope that is compelling to you as it is to me. Okay, so now we have to switch gears to the Romans. Um, and I'm not going to talk nearly as much about Roman naval warfare because it really kind of moved away from the prowess of rowers. Um, there was a the development of polyremes, so ships with more than three banks of oars potentially, or um, there's some debate, but there were quinquiremes and quadrireems, so five oared ships and four oared ships, but the, the thought was that there's um, not really a consensus about how those rowers were arranged. Sometimes it maybe meant there were four or five rowers per oar, um, or potentially there were three banks of oars and two of those banks had two rowers per oar. So there's some debate about how those ships were actually laid out. 
but the ships got bigger and heavier. And so the emphasis shifted away from having skilled oarsmen and, and ramming and it turned towards brute force and boarding. So it became more relevant that you had um, skilled land soldiers on the decks of the ships who could then basically turn a naval battle into a land battle. So some key Roman naval battles um, happened in the Punic Wars, which they fought with Carthage for control in the Mediterranean. And Carthage was initially superiorly skilled from a naval perspective, um, but the Romans developed um, an enhanced like boarding mechanism on their ships called the Corvus. And so they were able to um, eventually defeat the Carthaginians in the Punic Wars. And there were also some civil wars that occurred Caesar Civil War had some naval battles, which I'll actually talk about in the literary section of this. And then there was the Battle of Actium, which is another hugely consequential battle in a naval battle in history, which was between the forces of Octavian at the time, who became Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, against the um, forces of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And again, it was a naval battle, um, less focus on the skilled oarsmen, although the ships were all manned by rowers. And the conclusion of it was Octavian's defeat of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, him consolidating and securing power and basically establishing the Roman Empire. Um, so it's the end of the Republic. And at that point, as you can see in this map, the Romans, the Roman Empire basically had complete control over the Mediterranean. So at that point, they didn't really need to maintain a strong navy because um, they really just needed to kind of patrol and keep the peace in the Mediterranean. Um, they even called it at that point Mare Nostrum, our sea, because they had such complete control over it. Um, and there were later on, I'm sure you've all heard of the gladiatorial contests where they would flood the arenas and stage naval battles. So those were called Naumachia and um, they would get soldiers and warships and have them fight it out for the crowds um, later on in the empire. And I think the first one was actually put on by Julius Caesar. Okay, so we're about to switch major gears and talk now about literary depictions of all of these things that we've been talking about. So most of what's gonna come after this first one is going to be mythological in nature and focus on epic. But this first one was an epic written by Lucan called the Pharsalia or Di Bello Kiwili um, on the Civil War. And it was an epic poem of historical rather than mythological subject, which was unusual, but it focused on the civil war between Caesar and Pompey and the Roman Senate. And it was written during the reign of Emperor Nero. So this translation is from Jane Wilson Joyce. And this was his description of a naval battle during that, um, in that epic. So it was during the civil war between Caesar and Pompey and the naval battle was in Massilia. So the sea lay calm, dead calm, set aside for war. From every anchorage, each captain's vessel sprang forth. With rival strength, Caesar's ships on one side, the Greek fleet on the other rose on their drumming oars, urged forward the hull shuddered, staccato strokes sent the tall ships tearing along. The Roman fleet formed up, stout triremes and those propelled by a four-tiered bank of rowers and ships that dip even more oars in the brine. Liburnians, fast craft content with a mere two banks, hang back. Brutus's flagship, driven by six banks of slapping blades, advances its bulk over the deep, her topmost oars groping for distant water. And then continues, when only as much of the sea lay between them as each fleet could rush across with a single beat of the blades, countless voices rose and swirled in the wide clear air, drowning the sound of the oars percussion till no bugle notes could be heard. Then the rowers swept the blue, leaning back on the thwarts, thumping their breastbones with oar halves. As soon as beaks collided and crunched opposing beaks, the ships backed water, moving stern first. And now the tips of the crescent spread as the prows drew apart. Um, so again, uh, the importance of backing uh, and being able to back a boat is in here. Um, okay, now the Greeks had light maneuverable craft that darted in to attack or swooped away in flight quick to change course with a tight turn, not slow to answer a swing of the tiller, but the Roman ships provided a stable footing, a surface with purchase fighting men liked as well as dry land. Any vessel that tried Brutus's strength stuck fast, grapples and smooth link chains caught other boats or they fouled their own oars. The sea was solid wood. In this naval battle, the sword performs most deeds. Brutus's victory at sea was the first to aid maritime glory to Caesar's arms. So, Kind of a literary depiction that kind of covers in you know more 
vivid details, the stuff that we've been talking about, about how Roman naval battles sort of turned into land battles. Um, and I thought it was a beautiful poetic depiction. I really enjoy the Pharsalia, which I think is not nearly as widely read as many of the other epics. But um, kind of concluding the Roman, the modern Roman portion, or not modern, but later Roman portion, we're going to dive back now to basically the age of heroes. Um, so some of the earliest myths that the Greeks had about um, the heroic men, the demigods who walked the earth. And so one of those early stories was the myth of Jason and the Argonauts, which I think most of you have probably heard of. Um, and Jason and the Argonauts, kind of that generation, those crew of heroes, were probably the generation before the Trojan War. A lot of the parents of the, the Greek heroes at the Trojan War were on the Argo. And so the Argo was a ship, um, and Jason was the captain of it, and he had a crew of heroes who sailed on an impossible quest to um, retrieve the Golden Fleece from faraway Colchis. Um, and so the Argonautica that uh, I'm going to quote from was written by Apollonius, um, an, a writer in the third century BC. Um, and this translation is from R.C. Seaton. Um, and I should add, before I get any further, um, a lot of the times with these translations, I've kind of shortened sections of them. Um, but mainly, they're just sort of highlighting passages from ancient literature that have um, the focus on rowing. And I kind of hope that as you go through them, you'll connect them to your own rowing experience, because they're certainly connectable bits. Um, OK, so the proem of the Argonautica um, began with this sentence, beginning with thee, O Phoebus, I will recount the famous deeds of men of old who sped well-benched Argo in quest of the Golden Fleece. So right from the beginning of the poem, the, the ship is referred to as well-benched, and that refers to the rowing benches. Um, so here's the passage when the Argo departs on this grand quest. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, now when gleaming dawn with bright eyes beheld the lofty peaks of Pelion, and the calm headlands were being drenched as the sea was ruffled by the winds, then Tiphys, who was the helmsman, awoke from sleep, and at once he roused his comrades to go on board and make ready the oars. And the heroes went to the benches, one after the other, as they had previously assigned for each row in his place, and took their seats in due order near their fighting gear. So they, to the sound of Orpheus's lyre, smote their oars and the rushing seawater, and the surge broke over the blades. And on this side and on that, the dark brine seethed with foam, boiling terribly through the might of the sturdy heroes. And their arms shone in the sun like flame as the ship sped on, and ever their wake gleamed white far behind like a path seen over a green plain. On that day, all the gods looked down from heaven upon the ship and the might of the heroes, half divine, the bravest of men then sailing the sea. And on the topmost heights, the nymphs of Pelion wondered as they beheld the work of Itonian Athena and the heroes themselves wielding the oars. So pretty cool. Um, oh. The next bit, um, uh, some of us maybe have had this experience or have seen someone else have this experience, but the famous Greek hero Heracles breaks his oar. So, for all around the windless air smoothed the swirling waves and lulled the sea to rest, and they, trusting in the calm, mightily drove the ship forward, and as she sped through the salt sea, not even the storm-footed steeds of Poseidon could have overtaken her. Nevertheless, when the sea was stirred by violent blasts, which were just rising from the rivers about evening, for spent with toil, they ceased. But Heracles, by the might of his arms, pulled the weary rowers along all together and made the strong knit timbers of the ship to quiver. Then Heracles, as he plowed up the furrows of the roughened surge, broke his oar in the middle. In one half, he held in both his hands as he fell sideways. The other, the sea swept away with its receding wave. And he sat up in silence, glaring round, for his hands were unaccustomed to being idle. Um, so yeah, if any of you have had the experience in a race, especially of having an equipment breakage and being unable to continue competing, I think we can all empathize with Heracles in this moment. And then the, there's a funny passage after this where he goes to find a pine tree and he uproots a pine tree so that he can use it to fashion a new ore. So next we have an epic simile, which were common in epic. Um, most famously, uh, Homer would often use them to um, you know, compare Achilles to a lion on the battlefield. So now we get one for rowers. So all the windless night in the day, they gave unwearying labor to their oars. 
And even as plowing oxen toil as they cleave the moist earth and sweat streams in abundance from flank and neck and from beneath the yoke their eyes roll askins while the breath ever rushes from their mouths in hot gasps, all day long they toil, planting their hoofs deep in the ground. Like them, the heroes kept dragging their oars through the sea. Um, so again, I think maybe a lot of us have been there at the end of a long row when we're getting tired. Uh, so there's that connection. And then I think this is the last bit from the Argonautica. Um, but this passage was, um, the sh there were all these dangers on the Argo's journey. And this one was sets of rocks that would clash into each other. Um, and so they send a dove through the passage to see how fast they need to row through to survive. So here's the passage. Now when they reached the narrow strait of the winding passage, hemmed in on both sides by rugged cliffs, they went forward sorely in dread. And now the thud of the crashing rocks ce ceaselessly struck their ears and the sea wash shores resounded. And they, at the bidding of Tiphys, rode with goodwill to drive Argo between the rocks, trusting to their strength. And as they rounded a bend, they saw the rocks opening for the last time of all. Their spirit melted within them, and Euphemus sent forth the dove to dart forward in flight. And the rocks shore away at the end of the dove's tail feathers, but away she flew unscathed. And the rowers gave a loud cry, and Tiphys himself called to them to row with might and main, for the rocks were paint again parting asunder. But as they rowed, they trembled until the tide returning drove them back within the rocks. Tiphys was quick to ease the ship as she labored with the oars. Euphemus strode among all his comrades and cried to them to bend to their oars with all their might, and they with a shout smote the water. And as far as the ship yielded to the rowers, twice as far back as she did leap back, and the oars were bent like curved bows as the heroes used their strength. So yeah, they were able to save themselves through the strength of their oarsmanship. And um, I think the next thing, yep, it's the Odyssey. So I feel like this is probably the moment we've all been waiting for, um, talking about ancient warfare or, or ancient boats, and the Odyssey should come up. Um, but incidentally, there's actually not that much about rowing, or at least that would be relevant to us as modern rowers in the Odyssey. There's a few things which I'll talk about. Um, but the Odyssey was written by Homer, or Homer, um, or some question about that, um, about whether Homer was one poet or just kind of a, a concept. But it was around 750 BCE, and it follows the travels and trials of Odysseus as he attempts to return home following the Trojan War. And so this translation is from Emily Wilson. And these are just two examples of a repeated line, but pretty much every time they start rowing in the Odyssey, there's a very similar version of this line. Um, so they embarked, sat on their rowing benches, and struck their oar blades in the whitening sea, or quickly they sat at their rowing benches all in order and struck the gray salt water with their oars. So there's lots of passages like that. Um, and then there's a couple interesting things that come up um, related to rowing when Odysseus has his trip um, to visit the, or to speak with the dead. He doesn't actually descend into the underworld, but he performs a ritual so he can speak with dead souls. And his comrade Elpenor's, um, Elpenor had died recently. And so Elpenor makes this request of him when he goes to speak to the spirits and says, at the end of it, he says, will you fix into the tomb the oar I used to row with my companions while I lived? Um, so I thought that was notable. And then he receives, Odysseus receives a prophecy from a prophet Tiresias who tells him that his long journeys will not be over until he does this, which is that he has to go away and take an oar to people with no knowledge of the sea. They've never seen a ship's red prow, nor oars, the wings of boats. When you meet somebody who calls the thing you carry on your back a winnowing fan, then fix that oar in earth and make fine sacrifices to Poseidon. So the winnowing fan was an item of agriculture, a tool of agriculture. And so the idea was that he had to go far enough away from the sea that nobody would um, know what an ore was anymore. So just kind of another interesting thing there. And then the famous passage where rowing comes into play in the Odyssey is the trip past the sirens. And so the sirens were uh, mythical creatures that would lure sailors with their voices. They'd sing and promise knowledge beyond what all mortal men would typically be able to attain. And so of course, this is something Odysseus was very interested in. And so he instructed his men to, uh, to tie him to the mast and they were all to plug their ears with wax so that they couldn't hear and row past. And so the passage here is, 
Soon our well-built ship neared the island of the Sirens and suddenly the wind died down. The men sat at oar and made the water whiten, struck by polished wood. They bound my hands and feet straight upright at the mast and they sat and hit the sea with oars. We traveled fast and when we were in earshot of the Sirens, they started singing. I told my men to free me, but they kept rowing on. So as you can see, there's a famous vase painting that depicts this scene with Odysseus um, strapped to the mast. But that's kind of it for major rowing scenes. They do row through the, um, they have to face Scylla and Charybdis after this, and they row through the two, two, one was a whirlpool and one was a moss, monster that would eat sailors as they went through. And they kind of row through Scylla and face that trial, but there isn't really much in the, the writing about the rowing. So we'll skip that passage. But the next big thing, and this is kind of the culmination of the talk. Um, so the, now we get to the Trojan part of the title, um, Virgil's Aeneid, which was a Latin epic poem. It was written between 29 and 19 BCE under the reign of Augustus. It tells of the wanderings of the Trojan refugee Aeneas, um, who fled with the surviving Trojans after the Trojan War. And it builds on the literary legacy of Homer, um, parts of the Aeneid, are reminiscent of Odysseus's wanderings. Parts of them are, are, are reminiscent of the Iliad and the warfare and the fighting that happened in that. And it also ties the story of Aeneas into the eventual legend of the founding of Rome. Um, so it's kind of like patriotism and glorification of Rome all wrapped into this story about epic heroic origins. Um, but perhaps most significantly for us, it contains a scene that has almost no literary precedent. It's a thrilling rowing race, but one that is competed purely for sport. And the context is that in book five, Aeneas holds funeral games to celebrate the death of his father, um, which parallels the Iliad, where Achilles holds funeral games to celebrate his companion Patroclus, who had died. Um, and the translation I'm going to read is from Alan Mandelbaum. Um, I would ask, that as I read through, and I, I might pause and make some interjections, but I want you guys to imagine a time that you've raced and put yourself into the mindset of the crew as, as Virgil describes it. So uh, it starts off, the prizes are laid out awaiting the victors. From the central mound, the trumpet blares and the games have now begun. The first event is entered by four galleys, matched evenly, each heavy oared and chosen from all the fleet. Menestheus directs the swift shark Gaius drives the Chimera, huge in bulk, a city size with triple tiers of oars, rowed by three files of Trojan youths. Sergestus rides on the giant centaur. Last, Cloanthus rides sea green Scylla. Then Aeneas lays out the race course. He hangs a leafy branch at a rock out on the sea, which the crews are to turn around and then race back to the start. So they choose their places by lot. Above the sterns, the captains gleam in purple and gold. The oarsmen are crowned with poplar leaves. Their naked shoulders are glistening, wet with oil. They man the benches. Their arms are tense upon the oars. They wait, expectant for the start, as throbbing fear and eager love for glory drain their high hearts. Um, that passage honestly always gives me chills because that is exactly how I feel at the beginning of a race. Um, and I always think about it now when I'm at the start line. So. At last, with a bright trumpet blast, at once they all shoot from their starting places. Shouts of sailors beat against the skies. The waters are turned to foam beneath stroking oars. They cleave the furrows with their equal thrusts. The whole sea gapes, torn by the oars, the ship's three-pointed beaks. Not even chariots, when with their racing teams they seize the field and rush out of their starting stalls, are so swift, so headlong. Not even charioteers can shake their waving reins above their breakneck horses and bend to beat and lash with so much power. Then the cheers and the applause, the cries and eager calls of followers, fill all the woods, the Hemden beaches roll with the echo, and the struck hills give back the roar. So the chariot race reference here is probably a reference to the fact that this rowing race basically replaces the chariot race that occurred in the funeral games that occurred in the Iliad, um, which was pointed out by Carl Anderson, who is a classics professor who wrote about this event and who is also a scholar. Um, okay, so the crews maneuver and they approach the midpoint rock. Gaius is ahead, Cloanthus is close, his crew is better, but his ship is bulky and the other two are jockeying behind them. Gaius shouts to his pilot, why so hard to starboard? Turn, hold close to the boulder. Let the oar blades scrape along the shoals upon our left. Let others keep to the deeper waters. Cloanthus now shaves the left-hand channel and quickly takes the lead. Gaius spurs on his oarsmen, turns his rudder toward the shore. 
So if any of you have raced ahead of the Charles, I think you might identify with that passage, um, or really any head race where steering and buoy lines come into play. Uh, next, as Gaius slowed, the pair behind, Sergestus and Menestheus, took new heart. They hoped to catch him. Sergestus is the first to gain the channel beside the rock, but not enough to take a boat length lead, only a part. The shark, his rival, overlaps him with her prow. But Menestheus, pacing midship, spurs his sailors. Now, now, rise to your oars, comrades of Hector, the ranks I chose in Troy's last agony. Now, now, put forth the powers, and now the heart you showed in past trials. I do not seek the first prize anymore or try to conquer Neptune. Let those whom so choose be victors. And yet it would be shameful to be last, my countrymen. At least shun that disgrace. So I think we've all maybe been there as well. I certainly have been. Um, and I find that speech incredibly powerful as a rower. Um, and then they thrust upon their oars. They give it their all. The brazen galley quakes with hefty strokes. The seabed is drawn out from under them. Their hurried panting shakes their limbs and parched throats. Sweat is streaming everywhere, but chance itself brings them the longed for victory. So Sergestus takes two tight a line and he crashes his boat. Menestheus, still keener now and glad with his success, with rapid strokes and calling on the winds, makes for the sloping shoreward waters, glides straight down the open sea. So the shark cuts the final stretch of waters in her flight, her first impulse enough to drive her on. Now Menestheus leaves behind the floundering Sergestus as he calls out in vain for help and learns to race with broken oars. Then Menestheus passes Gaius, who rides the giant hulk to Chimera. She gives way. And now the goal is near. Only Cloanthus is left and Menestheus makes for him and straining with all his power presses forward. Then indeed the shouting doubles as the chase is urged along by many cheers. The heavens re-echo with the roar. Cloanthus' crewmen now think it is a disgrace to fail to keep the fame and honor they themselves have won, but they would give up their very lives for glory. And Menestheus' men are strengthened by success. They have the power because they feel they have it. And now, perhaps both prows abreast, the men of Menestheus could have won the prize had not Cloanthus, stretching up seaward with both hands, poured prayers and called upon the gods with vows. You gods who rule the kingdom of the seas, whose waters I now race upon to keep the promise that I pledge. He spoke, and all the company of Nereids beneath the sea heard him, and Father Portunus drove on Cloanthus' ship with his great hand. She flies to land faster than south wind or swift arrow, then she rests in that deep harbor. At this, Aeneas, the son of Anchises, following custom, assembles everyone, then has the herald's loud voice proclaim Cloanthus as the victor. He crowns his temple with green laurel and has him choose prizes for each crew. The rest of the prizes are awarded, and then limping on broken oars, Sir Gestus's ship makes it back to shore. So that's the full scene. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, I think it's really incredible to read Virgil's um, depictions of the psychology of racing here. Um, especially the idea that, you know, the men are strengthened by success. They have the power because they feel they have it and, you know, desperately doing anything not to be last. Um, and even the idea that, it, you know, with a broken oar, you're going to do whatever you can to continue rowing and to finish the race. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed this passage. Um, I hope you guys all did too, but I know that not everybody races. I know that people are fairly recreational in some cases. So on a lighter note, I think this is completely universal and it's just sort of a more humorous note to close it out on after all the drama of epic. So finally a comedy. Um, Frogs was a play by the infamous comic playwright Aristophanes. It was performed in 405 BCE and this translation is from David Barrett and you don't really need much context for this scene. Basically the god Dionysus who was the god of revelry but also of theater um, travels to the underworld by boat accompanied by a chorus of frogs. So the classical Greek chorus in this case is uh, the frogs in the river. And so Charon the ferryman says to him, sit at the oar. Here, what are you doing? Dionysus, sitting on the oar like you said. Charon, I didn't say on the oar, Fatso. This is where you sit on the cross bench. Dionysus, like this? Charon, yes. Now stretch your arms forward and take hold of the oar. Dionysus, like this? Charon, don't talk so much. Just push us off. So Dionysus makes clumsy, clumsy efforts to get the boat moving. Dionysus, how do you expect me to move this thing? I'm not the seafaring type. Charon, it's easy. Come on, you'll soon have the singing to help you. 
So uh, I think anyone who's been a novice or has worked with novices can relate to this passage. Um, but then we get to probably my favorite passage in ancient literature. Um, so first of all, we have the chorus of frogs, um, and they're singing one of my favorite Greek words, which is an automatopoeia for the sound that they make, uh, brek kek kek coax coax. Um, and they're also singing words, but I didn't put those in. So Dionysus, I don't want to row anymore. And then the frogs croak. Dionysus, my bottom is getting too sore. And the frogs croak. Dionysus, but what do you care? You're nothing but air, and your coax is really a bore. And then the frogs continue. And then Dionysus goes, what a sweat. I'm all wet. What a bore. I'm so raw. I'm so sore. And what's more, there are blisters here all over my rear where I've never had blisters before. And then the frogs close us out. Um, I don't think the actual ancient Greek rhymed like that, but I do appreciate the humor of this translation. I hope you guys like that. So in conclusion, um, I'm sorry, I've gone a bit over time. Um, I guess oftentimes as a classics major, you kind of have to tell people why you study the classics. Um, and, you know, that sort of ties into why I think this talk is relevant and why I hope that you guys felt so as well, um, which is that basically, he, classics is often or used to be considered like the core study of the humanities. And I think the reason we study it is because of its humanity and because of this connection that we feel to people who lived two and 3,000 years before us. Like it's just completely evident when you read this that or hear this that um, people were the same. People were people even that long ago, even with the millennia that separate us. And so as a rower, being able to read and connect to ancient epic as they write about rowing passages and to think that the rowers were core to and essential to Athenian democracy is just, uh, it's usually invigorating, invigorating for me and it really makes me feel connected to humanity as a whole. Um, so yeah, I hope some of you got some of that from the talk. Um, I guess as a final note, I uh, just want to do some thanks and acknowledgments um, to all my high school Latin teachers, the professors of the Middlebury Classics Department, all the rowing coaches I've had, which means I get to thank Troy about three times, um, and the Craftsbury Outdoor Center. Um, I will share in the chat in just a moment um, a link that's kind of a placeholder on our website right now, but eventually the recording of this will be posted there along with further reading and viewing, including a longer video about the modern trireme um, and the sources that I used in my talk. And here's my email address. I'd love to hear from you about this talk or about the webinar series in general. Um, and I can send that in the chat in a moment as well. Uh, but I'll stop sharing my screen now. Okay. Any questions, Troy? Um, yeah, a couple. Um, to start with, there was a question about, and it first referenced um, your revelation that the Greeks may have had the sliding seat, and it prompted the question of whether you knew anything about diet and or training method, whether there was any uh, reference to that in anything that you've researched, um, and if there are parallels between surprising ancient training methods that may seem more modern than we would think. Um, I couldn't find much about specifics. The thing in Thucydides about, you know, it, it's, it, uh, the rowers won't be at their prime for very long was the thing that sort of gave me the hint that they probably did have some scientific or scientific thought to their training, uh, at least to the extent that they were able. Um, we just know that they did train. Um, there potentially are sources out there that cover it and that I haven't encountered. Um, in terms of how much they ate or like their diet, um, I don't know specifics per se, but um, the, in Thucydides, there's often talk of the rowers because they couldn't keep the triremes on shore or on, on the water overnight and also because um, they didn't really have any room for storage on the triremes. Um, so there's a lot of, when, you, when there's narratives about triremes, going um, along the sea, they often talk about them stopping on shore to, um, to fuel and for provisions. And so I kind of skip those parts in the Argonautica, but that's also, there's a lot of scenes where they stop rowing and go on shore to eat. And it kind of mentions them rowing anytime they row into island or harbor. Um, but yeah, nothing specific, unfortunately. Um, okay, the uh, sort of the, the longest chatter in the chat 
had to do with the role of the pipers on the Athenian ships. And the first question uh, had to do with what, what exactly, what sort of instrument were these pipers actually using? And uh, there were a couple of answers in the chat. Uh, and somebody asked about whether the role of the piper was similar to the role of the coxswain and so on and so forth. So if you could address the, the piper and various aspects of that job to the extent that you uh, know about that information. Okay. Um, um, I think this is another one where unfortunately I probably don't know enough about it. Um, and I don't know if that's because it's not really in the sources. I did, my understanding was that um, the modern trireme Olympias that they did sea trials with was like they were trying to kind of figure out the role of the piper because it wasn't really specifically addressed in literature. Um, we just know that there was one on board. I think in the in the quote in the passage from Lucan on the first salia, they mentioned like the, the bugle on board. And I don't I don't know what the Latin was for that word. The translator chose the word bugle. Um, but yeah, there's some indication that there was music that was used to help keep the crews in time. And I'm not sure how much more in depth we really know about that. Um, I do, in the link that I shared in the chat just a little while ago, um, I did link to a 14 minute long video about the sea trials that they did with the Olympias. Um, so I think maybe that's covered a little more in depth in that video, um, which is worth watching. Okay, um, next question. Uh specific to the trireme, I believe, are, are the three tiers of oars, one in front, then in back, one beneath, one above, last above the other two, uh, trying to work out oar lengths by distance from the water. Um, can you speak to the configuration of the trireme beyond what we've seen in the slides? Yeah, um, I, it's hard for me to describe. My understanding is that there were basically three tiers, so the, um, the top tier, and I can't remember, there were three names for like the three tiers of rowers, um, like the Thranatoi, the Zugatoi, and the Thalamatoi, I think, something like that. Um, but the top row, um, they had it a little better off because they had more exposure to the open air. Um, the ones on the bottom were definitely gonna be more cramped, but they were kind of set like this and probably also staggered a little bit um, fore and aft. And um, again, I think, Describing it is difficult, but the video of the modern trireme, uh, which I shared, and also if you just kind of Google trireme Olympias, that's kind of our best approximation of what the actual layout of the rowers was. So you can watch and how they put modern rowers in there and how they arranged them in that trireme. Okay. Um, next one, uh, is there any evidence that women rowed in the ancient world, either recreational or otherwise, and a related, similar, well, maybe not similar, a related question. Um, most of the talk about uh, rowing in the ancient world centered on warships. Um, is there a precedent in the ancient world for uh, single sculling or even uh, single person uh, rowing boat of any kind, sort of like the, the punts that you see on the Thames and so on and so forth? Mm -hmm. Um, sure. Okay. So the second bit I'll address first. Um, there was definitely punting in ancient Egypt, and I don't know if those were one-person boats, but I imagine they were. And I, yeah, I think that any rowing that involved more casual transportation um, probably would have involved much smaller boats. Um, I think this is kind of often the case with history in general, is that it, it usually focuses on military history. And so we know a lot about the big battles, and we don't know as much about the lives of people in between the big battles. Um, so I did not find any specific sources that referred to smaller boats. Really the smallest one that I was reading about were the, um, uh, the Pentaconter, which was 50 rowers. Um, and I, I forget, I think I forgot to mention this, but the ship, the, the Argo and the ships of Odysseus were most likely Pentaconters or similar to those. Um, but to get back to the topic of women, which I'm super glad was asked because this topic, it, this topic and this talk was very male heavy. Um, two things. One, the Argo was crewed entirely by men, except for in some sources, a woman named Atalanta was on board and involved in some of the escapades of the Argo. Um, she was not mentioned by Apollonius in the version that I was quoting from, but it's a myth that has tons of versions written by, about by many people and just told well before it was ever written down. And so there are sources that reference Atalanta as having been on board. She's also famous in mythology for 
being faster than any man and she did not wish to marry and so she held a running race to determine who her husband would be and would have won. Um, basically the winner would have been able to marry her, but she entered the race and she would have won except the goddesses interfered and threw apples in her path. Um, so she was distracted and did not win the race. Um, so Atalanta is a really cool figure from mythology. But from history, in the Battle of Salamis, um, there probably weren't any women rowing that, that we know of, but one of the Persian warships was commanded by a woman named Artemisia. Um, if you've seen the sequel to 300, she's featured in it, although not with any historical accuracy. Uh, but she was well respected by Xerxes and um, he consulted her for uh, tactical advice in some cases. And during the Battle of Salamis, Xerxes was watching and Artemisia survived. Her, her ship survived the battle by, um, she actually sunk a friendly ship with her ship. Um, and Xerxes thought that she sunk a Greek ship, um, but it turned out to be a good tactical move because she was able to escape um, and survive. So yeah, there was one um, incredibly badass female commander in the Battle of Salamis. Well, speaking, speaking of Artemisia, of whom I have either never heard or have forgotten never having heard of, um, the, the name obviously bears a close resemblance to Artemis. And if she was Persian, does that mean that the Persians shared overlapping mythological figures with the Greeks? So um, I think their religions were fairly distinct at the time, but the Persians had done quite a bit of conquering at that point. And so the, um, the Persian empire incorporated people from tons of different societies and civilizations. And so like, for example, Herodotus, who's a famous Greek historian was uh, born in Halicarnassus, which is like on the shore of what's now Turkey. Um, and so he was born as a subject of the Persian empire, even though then he made his subject um, the Greeks defense of the Greek way of life during the Persian Wars. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of mixing of cultures um, at the time. And so I, I don't know exactly where Artemisia was from, um, but she could very much have had a, a more like Greek religion origin to her than she might, she didn't necessarily follow the Persian religion, even though she was an ally. Okay, uh, I think we're at the end of the questions that I have received in the chat, and um, I, I thank you for that fascinating talk. I, I was uh, sort of amazed that I had never heard reference to the idea that rowing may have uh, saved Western civilization and democracy itself. I, I, uh, it's a little I dramatic, taught, but... <laughs> well, I, I was taught to row by, uh, by a guy who did the New York Times crossword puzzle in ink and was a classics major himself. And I, I would have, he had a flair for the dramatic. I would have thought that he would have said something about uh, the, the Battle of Salamis, but he never did. In any event, um, uh, thanks everyone for coming to the 12th webinar. We will have a 13th next week. Join uh, Rick Ricky and myself and possibly some guest coaches. Might be some cameo appearances. We never know. Um, but uh, it's been a great afternoon. Uh, Erica, we neglected to share the outro music. So I'm, I'm actually going to have to abdicate as producer of this thing to, to let you start the outro music for us. Um, and you can... Uh, you can also tell the story of, uh, of, of its origin um, to close us out for okay. those who haven't heard the story three times already. Okay, um, and I feel like I neglected to say this earlier, but thank you so much to all of you for joining. Um, I appreciate how many people were interested in hearing about this fairly niche intersection of interests. Um, okay, so the outro music is, um, it was given to us by two people who had been uh, listening to the webinars um, and heard Troy joking about needing outro music to make the ending of talks less awkward. Um, and so Marisol and Chris Kuborn are musicians and they recorded and sent it to us and told us we could use it. Um, it's called Craftsbury Tune. And without further ado, can you hear us? Can you hear it, Troy? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe turn it up just a little. Um, as, as the saying goes, if it's too loud, you're too All right, we're gonna let this play all the way through. Committed to the outro music. Thanks for coming. We'll, uh, 
we'll see you and uh, wave goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Uh, send me an email if you want to talk more.